Welcome to another Ginger GM production. My name is Guyan Jones, and in this DVD I'll examine the Grand Prix attack. The Grand Prix attack is a successful sideline against the Sicilian defence, like the most popular reply to 1e4. I played it myself for many years, and I'm probably the world's leading expert on the line. A couple of years ago I wrote a book on it, and I've had wins against many of the world's top players, including the Dutch Grandmaster Luke Van Welly and the Russian Sergei Rublevsky. The line became fashionable after it was used by Mark Hebden and Dave Rumans in the 1970s and 1980s weekend circuit in England, where they racked up many quick wins. In this DVD, we'll examine a lot of my own games and see how many strong players have completely crumbled and collapsed against our very straightforward and simple attacking play. <laughs> In the early days of the variation, the move order normally played was e4, c5, f4, immediately grabbing the base on the king side. However, black came up with a good antidote with d5 when we don't have a great move. If we play e5, black will get a good caro can or French position because he'll be able to develop his bishop out to f5. If we take this pawn on d5, black normally plays knight f6, when we can keep hold of this extra pawn with c4, but after e6, d takes e6, bishop takes e6, black has great play with a very strong square on d4 and a big development advantage for the pawn. This isn't the reason we play the Grand Prix attack. Therefore, uh, these days we play two knight c3 first. I'll just show you quickly. We play one e4, c5, two knight c3. And only then we play f4, cutting out this d5 option. Recently, the nuance e4, c5, two d3 has been tried by none other than Luke McShane, who is currently England's number two player. The idea is again to go into a Grand Prix position after 3f4, but he's hoping that the knight is more flexible on b1 uh, and may not have to go to c3. However, I'm going to cover two knight c3 because after 2d3, knight c6, f4, I believe d5, might still be a problem for white here. Instead, with the knight on c3, we have greater coverage over the centre, and we don't allow. <laughs> to start off with, we'll see the main reason that we play the Grand Prix attack. This is the number one plan. We go e4, c5, knight c3, d6, and of course, 3f4. Black Finchetto's his bishop with g6, which is very sensible. We develop our knight, knight f3, bishop g7, and bishop c4. Immediately putting this bishop on a very strong diagonal, attacking the weak f7 pawn. In the theory section, later on in the DVD, I will also examine bishop b5 check, and I'll explain to you the difference between these two moves. He played his knight to c6, high castled, and e6. This is the main line of the 2d6 variation of the Grand Prix. Black immediately tries to block our bishop on c4 from hitting f7, but we can still generate a very strong attack. d3, completing our development, knight e7 and queen e1. This is an important move to remember in the Grand Prix. To start with, there's a tactical basis. The queen on e1 x-rays down to the king on e8, meaning that the d5 break, which as we saw uh, in the introduction is an important idea for black, fails here to 
e takes d5, e takes d5, and now knight takes d5, because the knight on e7 is pinned. That means that black can't break in the centre yet, and so has to decide what he's doing with his king. So, black played the logical castle king side. This has actually been considered a mistake because of the plan white adopts in this game. But recent analysis may, may show that it's playable, but we'll have a look at that later on in the DVD. F5. This is the move you always have to remember when you're playing the Grand Prix. If black takes with the e pawn, then our bishop on c4 is opened up against the pawn on f7. And we can continue with our plan of playing our queen out to h4, followed by probably our bishop on c1 to h6, exchanging this important defender on g7. Our knight on f3 will come to g5, and already you can see it's going to be impossible to defend both f7 and h7 pawns. In the game, my opponent decided to break with d5, ignoring the pawn for the moment. While in the theory section later on in the DVD, I will also look at g takes f5, which looks risky, taking with the pawn covering your king, but seems to be black's only option. Okay, so d5, I retreat my bishop, and he took on e4. It's hard to offer any good moves for him here, other than taking this pawn, as the plan of bringing our queen out to h4 and bishop h6 is very strong, even if he leaves his pawn on f5. Okay, so d takes e4, d takes e4, and now he decided to take this pawn on f5, g takes f5. So we've sacrificed the pawn, but we have great play against his king after queen h4. And already he's actually facing some direct problems. The number one being, of course, that I'm threatening knight g5 and queen takes h7 checkmate. While if he plays h6, which would be the only way to defend against it, I retreat my knight and he'll have big problems defending that pawn on h6 from the bishop c1. My opponent tried knight d4 going for counterplay, but this allows another idea behind the queen being on h4, namely bishop to g5, pinning this knight on e7, which has suddenly become very vulnerable. My opponent exchanged knights, knight takes f3, rook takes f3, so, in one sense, he's lessened the attack because he exchanged my knight, which looked very dangerous. However, now my rook on f3 has become a very strong attacking piece, as threatening to sidle over to either g3 or h3, hitting his king. He tried checking me, queen d4 check. Just play my king across, king h1, knight g6. Push my queen forward, queen h5. Already the threat of rook h3 is unstoppable. He took my pawn, f takes e4, rook h3, and there's now no way to defend this pawn on h7. He tried f5, at least to give his king a square on f7, but queen takes h7 check. King f7 and rook h6, exploiting the pin on the bishop on g7 to attack this knight. It's forced to retreat. And again, I exploited the pin on the bishop with rook f6 check. Now, if he moves the king, then the bishop on g7 is on pre, so he had to play queen takes, 
bishop takes, king takes, but after rook f1, bringing my final piece into the game and already hitting the f-file and hitting his king, he was in a lot of trouble. He tried rook h8, which looks like it traps my queen, but luckily I have knight takes e4 check, exploiting this pin. King f7, and now I broke through with rook takes f5 check, yet again exploiting a pin, this bishop on b3 suddenly become a major piece in the attack. Knight takes, queen takes f5 check, and in fact he resigned here. Perhaps it's a little early, but it's easy to see why he was demoralised, as wherever he moves his king, his pawns are dropping, and already his king is probably going to get mated within a few moves. The rook on a8 and bishop on c8 are useless. For example, king e7, queen takes c5 check, king f7, and I can come back again if I want with queen f5 check, or I can play knight d6 check. And it's easy to see that the king won't survive for very long. This is the number one plan that you will want to exploit as a king as a Grand Prix attack player. And it's easy to see how black can crumble straight away without playing any uh, moves that look like errors. That game that we just saw was my game against Zartaj, an Albanian player in the European Club Championships. And it showed the number one most important plan in the Grand Prix attack of playing our queen to e1 and out to h4 followed by breaking with f5 allowing our bishop on c1 into the game exchanging his important defender on g7 and his king is already in a lot of trouble.